to another video. Today we're going to talk about osmolarity. Now osmolarity is an important concept in understanding the renal system and in fact it's an important concept of understanding anywhere there is water flow. And we're going to be talking about osmolarity which is very closely related to the concept of molarity. Now you may recall from your general chemistry classes molarity is a is used to measure the amount of material in a liquid. Uh, and specifically, we're talking about a moles per liter. And it's used to measure any particular substance. So, for example, we could talk about a solution having a molarity for sodium ions, or having a molarity for glucose ions, or having a molarity for a particular protein. But when we're talking about osmolarity, we're talking about the amount of all materials that are dissolved in the liquid. Now, one key thing here, we're talking about osmolarity. This is uh, amount per liter, right? Very similar to molarity. Your book and other sources talk a lot about osmolality, which is a related but slightly different concept, and that is looking at an amount per kilogram of a substance. Uh, the key distinction here is that osmolality does a better job at accounting for um, the way water behaves in the presence of very large molecules, so things like proteins and um, you know very large glycolipids or, or something like that. Uh, for our purposes, though, osmolarity is fine. So we're going to talk about uh, why osmolarity is important, and to do that, I've built a little model. In order to understand what's going on with osmolarity and why it's such an important factor in determining what occurs in a cell, I set up a little demonstration where we have my cell and I have an intracellular space and extracellular space as well as a cell membrane which will allow certain materials to pass through and certain materials will not be able to pass through the cell membrane. So we're going to start off with something that can pass through. So we're going to have some little squares here to represent chloride ions. And so on this side we have four molecules of chloride, and this side we have zero molecules of chloride. So we could think of this, for example, as being four millimolar chloride, this being zero, zero millimolar chloride. So as you probably all remember for general chemistry, what would happen is this is a situation where we have a disequilibrium, and you know, we don't like that to occur, so things are going to move from high concentration to low concentration until they balance out. And again, I'm assuming that these little portals here is would represent a chloride channel through which chloride can move. So now things are in balance again as far as the chloride ions are, are concerned. Now I'm going to place the chloride ions back and we're going to look at something a little bit different. We're going to add something that cannot pass through our channels here. And so what I've chosen to throw in here are some molecules of glucose. Glucose is simply too large to pass the channels. It's polar, so it just bounces off the nonpolar cell membrane. So again, when we're talking about molarity, we can consider each one of these things separately. So we still have a disequilibrium for chloride, so chloride will move over from high to low concentration. But our molecules of sucrose, or I should say glucose, cannot move, so they're going to stay inside the cell. Now this creates a little bit of an interesting situation. We have more things that are dissolved inside the cell than are dissolved outside. And here's where osmolarity comes in. Because when we're talking about osmolarity, we're concerned about all things that are dissolved within a particular liquid. And we have more things dissolved on this side and less on this. Now to understand why this is important, we're going to add one more player. And that is some molecules of water. And I'm going to add five molecules of water to each side. And we're going to see what happens. Now you probably remember from general chemistry that water is highly polar. So it likes to interact with basically anything. So certainly, it's going to start interacting with our chloride ions. So I'm going to do that on both sides here. And glucose also has some polarity to it. We have a lot of OHs, hydroxyl groups, and so um, it's going to interact with the glucose as well. Now we have a bit of a problem, because on this side, we have some water molecules which really don't have anything to interact with, whereas on this side, everything is nicely paired up. And it turns out this situation will cause the movement of water. So the ones here that are not interacting with anything are sometimes called free water. So we have three free waters on this side and zero free waters on this side. So what's going to occur is water will balance out. It will try to move from an area of a lot of free water 
to an area where there's little. So I should have added one more, so I'm gonna add one more on the side. Uh, essentially what we could do is we'd leave two here, move two over, and everything's in balance. But you'll notice we've brought more water into the cell that would tend to expand this cell. So um, this cell would swell up a little bit. So again, we're talking about molarity. We're gonna be balancing things you know, species by species, molecule type by molecule type. When we're talking about water, we're gonna have everything up in each compartment and then see how water moves. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is you know, exactly a few rules for doing that. So now we're gonna talk about a few rules for osmolarity. And we really are only three. First of all, to determine the osmolarity of any particular substance, we are gonna take the number I should say the molarity of that substance, time the number of components it breaks down to when we're talking about water. So for example, if we're talking about sodium chloride, that would be it would break down to two things. Calcium chloride would break down into three, right? Glucose does not break down, so we're only talking about one. Okay. Key thing here, again, the idea of this we're talking about osmolarity. This works for most things when we're talking about osmolarity. If we're talking about something large, like an entire cell, or a large plasma protein, this would break down. Okay, and then we'd have to be talking about osmolality. So that slightly uh, different but related concept. But, you know, we can uh, figure out some osmolarities based on this. Rule two, right? Rule two is that all osmolarities add up. So once we determine the osmolarity for each particular component, they're all going to add up. So in our previous example, we added up the osmolarity that came from the chloride ion and the osmolarity that came from the sucrose, or I should say glucose ion, a glucose molecule. Those all added up to combine to determine the osmolarity for the cell and the osmolarity for the outside space. So we add everything up. And the third rule, right, which is always the one that people forget, is that when we're talking about osmolarity, Water moves from low to high osmolarity, right? Because again, what we're really talking about when we're talking about osmolarity is a low osmolarity means a lot of free water, right? And high osmolarity means little free water. So we're moving from an area of high free water to low free water, but when we're talking about osmolarity, we remember it's low to high. So Every time you encounter an osmolarity question, just stop and think about it, low to high. It's exactly the opposite of what you would think. So I hope that helps a little bit, and I will uh, see you guys in class.